Uh, so, as I mentioned, we're excited to be setting sail this summer with you as we journey through scripture that talks about the sea or takes place at sea. There are a few things I want you to keep in mind as we begin this series. First, we're using sea a bit more generally, as the passages we explore do use the term sea, but there are a few others we'll explore that take place in a river or is termed the flood. Secondly, as we journey this summer at sea, we'll be exploring passages all throughout the Bible, beginning at the very beginning of creation and the book of Genesis, and going through all through to the book of Revelation, seeing the waters at work and hearing stories that take place at the water. We're focusing in on the water and events that happen there, rather than the water being a, more of a second thought, like, and it happened by the water. Uh, we want to explore more of what biblical waters are and meant as we ourselves spend more time this summer at or in the water we have in our own backyards. It will be a summer of fun, of talking about water, thinking about being at sea. And so we hope you come along for the ride on Sundays and see how God is among us and at work in these passages that talk about the sea. As I was preparing for today, it's hard not to imagine a sea in your brain when you're envisioning a summer at sea. Have any of you been to a sea or been on a ship or traveled along maybe the Mediterranean Sea on a cruise? I saw some hands. Oh, there we go. Yes. <laughs> some recently just did that. Um, we we'll may, may have to get some of their photos later on. Um, but I gathered some photos from friends this weekend of them being at sea that we'll share throughout the summer. And so as you spend summer, um, and if you are at the sea or at the beach, um, feel free to email them to me. My email address is on the back of the bulletin. And you might see your photos show up in our sermons. How fun is that? And so here's a few pictures that I gathered um, from friends over this weekend of them being at sea. Um, I love the picture of Wyatt holding this amazing crab on the beach. That's awesome that he found that. Um, our friends Ruth and Ian, someone having fun and doing cartwheels. Um, our friend Julie and then a friend of mine took a nephew on a trip to San Diego. And so we had the beautiful waters off the shore of San Diego. And so when we think about sea, this is kind of what we imagine, this beautiful sea, um, the waters, this amazing, fun place. Um, when I think of the sea, I think of the only sea that I've been to, which was the Irish Sea, located along the eastern coast of Ireland, in between Ireland and Great Britain, as shown here. This is probably my favorite picture that I took. This is just standing off of um, the town that I lived in, this was a 25-minute walk away from where I lived. It was so beautiful, and I got to experience the sea in all of its glory, from a, a beautiful, peaceful sea in the late spring to summer months to the more raging and turbulent seas during the fall and winter months. But the seas that we'll talk about today are the nurtured, responsive, and gathered waters that we find at the opening of Genesis chapter 1. As we begin our summer exploring these waters, it makes sense to understand them from the point of their creation. And so with that, let's turn now to Genesis chapter 1. And if you are able, stand in honor of the reading of the word of God from Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 2 and 6 through 10. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. 
The opening words of the Bible, the book where we find who God is, what God's grand plan is to enjoy, to redeem and restore creation, are quite significant. There are a lot of different theories that have come out about how the world came to be, but in all my study for today, that is not the point of the book of Genesis, and especially Genesis chapters 1 through 3. What these chapters teach us is of God's creation intentions, the consequences of us turning away from God, humanity, and God's relationships to the world. We also see that this was written in a time frame in which Israel was surrounded by the Egyptians, Canaanites, Mesopotamians that had their own gods and goddesses and understood each to possess their own sphere of power and responsibility. Israel responding to that through their very first words of the Bible, of which we read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We see that Israel understood and believed that God was and is before all else and is the creator of all else. Within the first 10 words, we see the purpose of these writings is to report the functional beginnings of the earth, its systems and its creatures as God's cosmic temple. It's the inauguration of the earth as God's dwelling place, a place that God wants to be and dwell, from which God would direct the functions of the various entities and systems that God would put in place and set in motion. I love this perspective and I love this image of God creating the heavens and the earth, God as creator. God creating a dwelling place. Because when you think about God as creator, that gives us a way of relating to scripture right from the very beginning. Have any of you made something you were really proud of? I see some head shaking, yep. Mm -hmm. Yes, maybe you made a Father's Day card or a gift some years ago that you were really proud of. I did that some years ago, too. Uh, we celebrated our daughter's third birthday two weeks ago, and she got a painting set with an easel and painter's smock. And she loves it because she loves to paint. She loves to create. And every time she makes a painting, she's super proud of it and wants either Dan or I or both of us to come and look at the painting. She's like, Mommy, come look, come look. Um, and she won't stop saying that until I come and look because she's super proud of it. She is bursting with pride and joy at her creation. And it's the cutest thing that I love so much. And when I picture God creating, that's what I think of. I think of God creating with this pure joy and pride at what God had made. And when you make something you're really proud of, you want it to last. You want it to preserve or you want to hang up the painting and show it off. When we look at the Holy Scripture this morning, that's what we see in the response to it God had made. In verse 2, we see that the Spirit of God was hovering or brooding over the waters. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the term brooding, but for those who aren't, brooding, according to the Britannica Encyclopedia, is a pattern of behavior of certain egg-laying animals, especially birds, marked by cessation, of egg laying and readiness to sit on and incubate eggs. Many birds develop a brood patch, an area of bare featherless skin on the underbody, in preparation for incubation and brooding. A network of blood vessels in the skin of this brood patch raises the temperature locally to keep the eggs warm. After the hatch, the parent birds brood their young keeping them warm by spreading the feathers out, umbrella-like, so the young can maintain contact with the skin of the adult. That's what brooding is. Brooding is a special care and attention given to these young chicks by the parent to ensure their health and their survival. 
And I love how it says the adult bird maintains closeness and contact with their young. Because when we look at scripture, we see the same special care and attention of the Spirit of God brooding over the waters, protecting, caring for, nurturing, and being present so close to these waters. And so we see these waters right at the very beginning are nurtured waters. As I collected pictures this weekend of Friends at Sea, our very own Julie Schmidt sent me a picture that really speaks into this image of brooding. Here is Wyatt and his cousin Julie. And they're sitting at sea, and if you look pretty closely, she has a hand or hands on the back of Wyatt. It's a very nurturing, caring image. And I love that it takes place at the sea as we're talking about this very same thing of how God was caring and nurturing the waters. As I continued to be sent photos uh, from friends and fellow congregants, there were so many fun and joy-filled photos. The sea and the waters are a fun place to be. There's something about the water that brings out this childlike joy in us. It's important to remember this, as I think we sometimes read the beginning of creation and the waters of the face of the deep being this dark, chaotic, unruly place. But they were really these quiet, cared for, nurtured waters. The phrase of verse 2, the earth was formless and empty, gives us clues to the state of these waters. The earth, described as a stripped, and deserted tent or house is vacant, it's empty. Far from being unruly or a hostile nature in rebellion, the earth and its mantle of covering waters were still, motionless, receptive, waiting quietly in the darkness for God's next step as God's spirit brooded over these waters. I think it gives us hope knowing this about how God cared and tended to what God had made. It translates well to how God treats us, how God nurtures and wants to nurture us. Remember, this early narrative of the earth coming into being is a story that shows and describes God's relationship to all of creation, including us. This nurturing was not only over the face of the deep, but this nurturing continued as God made the skies and the seas, the land, the stars, the creatures of the sky, sea, and land, including us. God is a nurturing, loving, caring, gentle God that we see here that desires to be with us in a close, loving, mutual, reciprocal responsive relationship, just as these waters were at the very beginning. And as we move on from the first two verses and jump down to the next section of verses 6 through 8, we see there where the waters respond to God's nurturing and care and show themselves to be responsive waters. Up to this point, the narrative has pictured the waters as covering the whole surface of the earth. Now something would change with the waters. God changes the form, the characteristics and function of the water. God makes a vault or an expanse to place in the midst of these waters to separate them. In Hebrew, expanse referred to something that was shaped by beating out its malleable substance, such as a smith forming a gold, silver, or bronze bowl. The thing about this, though, is that in order to be shaped or molded, the material you're working with needs to be responsive. Otherwise, it won't take shape. There's got to be the right amount of heat or pressure 
that the material will respond to in order to take a different shape. Here, God took the formless and vacant waters of the earth and shaped and molded them into different parts of sky and sea. One commentator of Genesis noted that, indeed, when we have an unobstructed view of the entire 360-degree circle of the horizon, the sky looks like a bowl set upside down upon the edge of the earth. I wanted to show you guys a picture of this, but it's really hard to capture a 360-degree photo and show it to you. So I think in your mind's eye, you can imagine this because you've seen it before. I can trust that. <laughs> so it's not hard to imagine God forming and molding the earth and these waters into something beautiful, something different. But the waters needed to be responsive in order for that to happen and to take shape. In contrast to Israel's neighbors who regarded the seas as gods or goddesses, here we see how Israel viewed the waters not as gods in any shape or form, but as God's servants, allowing God to mold and shape and form them into something new. These waters have been put into a new frame of mind for me as I've worked through this passage and seen these waters in a new way in a nurtured and responsive way. It's encouraging to me because as I see these waters respond to God's shaping and molding, I see how beautiful it is of the relationship between God and these waters. And it's something that I desire to have as well, this wonderful, responsive relationship with God where I continue to let God mold me and shape me into something beautiful and new in a nurturing, tender, loving care sort of way. I'm not sure what the condition of your heart is as you've come today. Maybe there's room for it to be a bit more malleable, responsive to the love and grace of God that forms and shapes you more and more into his image. I pray for a softening of all of our hearts because it's really hard to work with material that is rock solid and stubborn, like scooping ice cream. It's a lot easier to work with softened ice cream. You can get a really good scoop and shape when it's softened and put it right on top of a cone and it's glorious. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Likewise, may we ourselves be softened so that we're malleable to the work of God and God's leading in our life. As we've seen these waters be nurtured and responsive to God's shaping, we see that they then become gathered waters. It is in verse 9 where God invites the waters and the dry land to participate in this stage of God's creative action, calling the waters to gather themselves to one place and for the dry land to show itself. Though God retains sovereignty, God invites responsive participation to gather. The command in its fulfillment is what we observe and experience today. The Earth's ocean's waters cover the Earth's great surface depressions, and all are connected, sometimes by narrow straits, rivers, or seas. And the dry land rises above these various depressions. God invited the waters to gather themselves and for land to appear, and we see that take shape as we experience today. You may have already begun making the connections that I have made. But doesn't this sound like what we're meant to do as God's people? We're meant to be nurtured, to be discipled, to be responsive to God, and to gather together as the body of Christ, the church. God has set in motion this beautiful cycle of creation that continues to infiltrate how we live our own lives. When we gather together as God's people, what a beautiful image it is 
and how glad and happy is our maker, our creator who rejoices at our active participation as we gather in response to his shaping and molding each and every one of our lives. I have a picture here of a baptism that our friend Rachel Rigg had sent me. She was serving on a medical missions team in Ecuador in 2018. And on the trip, one of the paramedics from Chile gave his heart to the Lord and was baptized in the waters off the shore of Ecuador. We see people gathered in this photo around this man to celebrate with and encourage this man as he responded to the love and grace of God in his own life. Water has a way of gathering us together, but so does our unity in Christ. And I love how this picture depicts both. One of the ways we gather as the body of Christ is when we gather around those who are being baptized. It is a significant moment in the life of that believer and the church as we get to be part of that celebration and that welcome into the body of Christ. And there's no better way than to be surrounded by your own brothers and sisters in Christ who will continue to journey with you on that walk of faith. As the church, this is what we're called to. We're called to gather so we can encourage uplift, journey, and walk with one another. Gathering around a baptismal, as we have in the past in church services, or gathering around in a body of water at sea to celebrate a believer's faith in Christ, is just one of the ways that we're drawn together. But it's not the only way. We're drawn together by mutual understandings of similarities in walks of life and faith, and most importantly, by God himself as God calls us to gather. As God called the waters to gather themselves, God calls us to gather for worship, for discipleship, for service, for showing what the kingdom of heaven on earth looks like. And evidently, we're doing well at being responsive as we're sitting here today, together or online, worshiping our creator God this morning. But it's not just these moments in life of the church when we're drawn together. We're drawn to gather with others outside the bounds of the church, too. Anytime you go to the beach, it's usually crowded, or you see other people there. It's not very often that you see a beach empty, especially in the summer months. We're drawn to these gathered waters. And they have a special way of gathering us together, whether we are Christian or not. When we see pictures of the water, the seas, it's awesome and amazing and beautiful. And we're like, I want to go. How many of you are starting to plan your beach trips now? Yeah, I see some hands. <laughs> same here. The same is true when we gather as God's people, the church working together in unity towards the redemption and restoration of the world. What a beautiful picture we give to those who are looking on, curious, wondering, skeptical of who and what we are. But the picture that we give them encourages them to wonder, to explore, to want to go and step foot in a church or at least have a conversation with someone about God. It makes them want to take a next step in that direction. And so I encourage you and I encourage us, the church, with a capital C, to not just give images of the church as a disjointed, grumpy, judgy place to be, but a place where really, truly, unity, diversity, and love reigns, where true peace and joy are seen and felt, and a place where we feel as if we're standing at the shore of the water, feeling that overwhelming sense of peace and joy that being at the water brings. May we not stand in the way of others' experience of that, and may we not stand in our own way of that by keeping a hardened heart. May we keep our focus on God and be open to being nurtured, to being molded and gathered so we can respond well 
and live as fully as we can as God's good creation that God delights in. Let me pray for us. Loving, caring, tender, nurturing God. What a gift it is to be able to see and hear this message this morning of how you created and shaped and molded these waters. And really how you've set into motion how we are to be responsive to you as your creation. May we be reminded that you delight in us, that you want the best for us. You want to nurture us and to help us grow. And God, you desire that so that we may have this redeemed and restored relationship with you that gives us this beautiful new life that only we can experience through you. And so God, this morning, as we receive your nurturing, tender, loving care, may we be responsive to that. May you soften our hearts more and more so that we can be more malleable and be more molded and shaped into your image. And as we are, may we be encouraged and motivated to be drawn together as these waters were drawn together, to be your people, to be encouraged and uplifted with one another, to be loved by one another, and to really truly know what that is, and to know this peace that you can give We pray for our church, God. We pray that we are this place where we feel as if we come into church this morning where we feel we're right at the beach, standing along the waters, feeling that peace, that relief, that joy. May we be a place that offers that to our community as they're seeking that in their lives. We thank you for this opportunity where we can be your nurtured, responsive, and gathered people. And may we not lose sight of that. We pray this in your name. Amen. As we close, I'm continuing to ponder, and I want you to ponder, what it is about the waters that almost instantaneously gives us that sense of relief peace, and joy. When we're at sea, we seem to be more at ease, able to let down our guards, be our silly, fun self, like we see here in this video. This is a video sent from friends of mine from Mountain Home. Um, But I just love seeing that. And when I opened that video, it just brought me joy watching these grown adults play with bubbles at sea, enjoying life. And I love that we can hear their laughter, their joy at play. They're they're laughing and, and having fun and even maybe laughing at themselves. And maybe there's some greater connection between who God created us to be and the waters that God created that brings this out of us. There's something that remains a mystery as to our connection with water. Maybe we'll uncover some of that mystery this summer as we spend summer at sea, exploring more passages of the biblical waters. As we go forth today, I'd invite you to stand as I send us out with this benediction, this blessing. And as Pastor Dan had mentioned last week, if you'd like to extend your arms to receive this benediction, that's very appropriate. May you allow yourself to be nurtured, discipled, responsive, softened, and gathered, the church. 
just as the waters were at the very beginning of creation, under God's tender, loving care. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. You are dismissed.